This video is sponsored by Squarespace. I don't know if I've ever said this about 2009 before, but 2009 was an exceptional film year where not only did we get a lot of great films, but they came in a variety of styles and genres. Then in 2010, most of the films, at least released by major studios, had become mostly CGI comedies. So the first time I did this list, I was a bit disappointed. However, there's no denying that CGI or not, we did get a lot of great films that year. Ready to relive the animation trends of a decade ago? Spoilers, there's a lot of 3D pushing. But first, I need to pay my respects to this video's sponsor, Squarespace. Animaniacs, if you have a passion project, whether for fun or for business, a great aid for self-promotion is, of course, a stylish professional-grade website. Enter Squarespace, an all-in-one award-winning website-building service. Whether you're trying to show off your portfolio, gallery, or videos, start a podcast or blog, sell your products, or just host your resume, Squarespace has a variety of award-winning templates to get started, all of which are also designed to work with mobile devices, and a plethora of customizable options to make it personal and unique that's simple to use and navigate. But it's also got a ton of other helpful features like site analytics, members only and password protected privacy pages, and finance and marketing tools. So when you're ready to promote your passion project, go to squarespace.com for a free trial to design your website, and when you're ready to make it go live, go to squarespace.com slash sellspecs to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. This one sucks, get a new one. It sucks, it sucks so friggin' much, it sucks so friggin' much. I know, I found something worse than Alpha and Omega. Well, in reality, there were probably about a dozen. I just refused to acknowledge their existence. And actually, even this one is kind of a coin toss. This is a Cartoon Network original CG movie, so you know it's quality. Right at the beginning, after getting over the disappointment of the animation downgrade after a pretty decent motion graphic intro, it was already pretty laughable. Oh, it's just so hard getting used to a new school when you're built and quaffed like a supermodel and you have all these amazing athletic and parkour skills. I just can't fit in. And okay, I know he looks like a lizard person, but in comparison to everyone else in this movie. But then, of course, he develops superpowers and has a crisis about his identity, but that's nothing compared to the true matter of urgency. Who is he gonna take to homecoming? Ah, but the twist is, well, actually the trailer says that his powers are that he's part dragon. He's part human. Part dragon. Ah, but no, he's part kaiju. And this is pretty much the only real point of quality. The kaiju designs and the kaiju fights are actually pretty good for what they are. I would perfectly understand if someone preferred this to the corny wolf movie. But other than this, there are really only two major takeaways. One, reminding you that he is half kaiju, and this aired on Cartoon Network. At one point, his mom is about to explain to him how he was conceived, and he's like, no! And I was like, shut up, boy, this just got interesting. I'm sure it's something boring, like he can shrink or whatever. Not that they ever demonstrate that. And two, how wrong it is that this movie is about an angry, fire-breathing teenager, and he is not played by Dante Bosco. But Dante Bosco is in the movie, playing the lanky emo kid that outs him because the girl he liked likes him instead. Just goes to show what kind of stories might have been interesting if they didn't take place in high school. Sure, a script with an Idaho, Idaho level of wit, but generally not quite as bad as I remember it being. But nothing that needed to be in a theater, and certainly nothing that justifies the tidal wave of defenders I got the first time I did this list because it inspired such a beloved franchise? Putting aside the discredited notion of Alpha and Omegas that had given birth to a lot of toxic mindsets and disturbing erotica, forgive me if the woes of the geek guy hooking up with the popular girl is not a concept that appeals to me in any way. And this movie clearly took a couple of cues from Happy Feet. Even if you don't have a problem with how weirdly sexual some kid films can be, it nonetheless highlights the massive hypocrisy that still exists in the entertainment industry in terms of what they will not allow gay characters to do. However, the goose and the duck do have a couple of funny lines, 
because they feel like they're in a completely different movie, and the B couple have moments of genuine convincing chemistry? My god, they had a real conversation and they helped each other and spent pleasant time together instead of arguing and awkwardly touching each other, which of course means they have to bang now. And of course, I remember one of the longest death fakeouts to the point where it got hilarious. At this point, I'm sure it's become a low-key, low-brow, nostalgic favorite to some, but that does not make it a good movie. I do believe the stink of Shrek 3 somewhat unfairly affected the general perception of this film when it aired. But in fairness, it wasn't just that. The refreshing nature that the first movie had had long since gone since every studio since then was now imitating them. Like a lot of things on this list, it's better than I remember it, but it doesn't really stand out as anything too special. Man, does that opening It Sucks to Be a Dad montage a rough intro to get through. Rumpelstiltskin is a functional villain, but he's not a compelling one, but his contract is kind of clever, and it does bring the franchise back to what it does best, focusing on the relationship between Shrek and Fiona. In a situation of suitable poetic justice, the only way for him to get close to Fiona and break the curse is for him to stop fixating on the curse and actually make up for the reason that he made the curse in the first place. And with the focus on the relationship leading to an ending that is genuinely sweet. But it is kind of a double-edged sword to play this movie as largely serious. On the upside, I do like a number of the serious and even romantic moments, but then you do really have to care about all of the other elements of this It's a Wonderful Life war story. But then how that also makes the contrast with the comedy a little bit too jarring, which may have been less of a problem if the comedy in this movie was actually funny. And most of the time it's not. I still remember these posters. There's a couple of highlights, but it's still not one of my DreamWorks favorites. I remember during the year that this film felt like a breath of fresh air, just because it wasn't a comedy. And now half of Zack Snyder's appeal is explained. Granted, it's a breath of fresh air in the family genre where there's an abundance of comedies, but for adult films, I do have better options. I can't say that story or character-wise this film leaves much of a significant impression. It is mostly by the book fantasy. The filmmaking, however, looks incredible. It has an ominous atmosphere, the action is intense and surprisingly violent for owls. In other words, it's a Zack Snyder movie, but possibly the best looking one he's made, especially if you love flying scenes and water effects. This was a pleasant change and is a decent entry for the dark family market, but it doesn't surprise me that nobody remembers. opposite problem of Shrek 4, where its impression was probably way better at the beginning as a cute entry for a new studio than now knowing how the studio has bled this franchise dry and not done too much more ambitious since then. Still, for a first entry of a new studio, Despicable Me's popularity is understandable. Distinct character designs, general low-key good sense of humor, especially when it came to Gru actually being despicable, enjoy it while you can, and it's just a cute little story of what if the world's most G-rated supervillain adopted three kids. The hijinks. But oi do I hate Victor, just everything about him. Revealing that young Gru acted similarly when he was a villain newbie is a cute callback, but I wouldn't call it worthwhile. And I admit, as merchandisable gimmick characters, the minions are kind of brilliant in limited quantities, but they just couldn't help themselves. Makes it even better when you realize only in a couple years it's gonna be nostalgic. I'm not a fan of puppeteers, but I have a nagging fear Someone else is pulling out the strings Something terrible is going down through the entire town Freaking anarchy and all it brings in the first list, I put Despicable Me and Megamind as a tie, acknowledging that Despicable Me's quaintness could be preferable to Megamind's DreamWorks flair. They did have similar themes, and also because I hated both of their villains. But now giving Megamind the edge is 
Not because of Illumination's reputation, but really, I just think Megamind's story and characters hold up a bit better. It's an intriguing parody of the Lex Luthor Superman dynamic, again, if it was way more G-rated. Roxanne Ritchie is one of the better love interest characters that I can stand. I love Megamind specifically as Bernard, probably the adorkable icon of 2010 if MLP hadn't premiered. I definitely laughed out loud more than in Despicable Me, but it also overreaches with its comedy at times, like that ending minion gasping scene, so it probably evened out in the end. But the tender moments work really well, and that last fight is pretty fun. If anything, I wish we had seen more of the relationship between Megamind and Metro Man just so that last line would mean anything. But one thing remains absolutely true. Megamind has the worst ending dance number of all time, at least done by a major studio entry. It has no coordination or sync with the music at all. Every character is just flailing around. As an AMV maker, this physically hurts me. I cannot call Colorful a fun movie. It is technically an uplifting movie, which is still hard to say when it spends more than half of it with the character being miserable, and most of it by his own design. The film opens with a soul in the afterlife being greeted by, for lack of better term, an angel, who tells him he has recently died after committing a sin, and if he wants to be admissible for reincarnation, he has to enter the body of a different person after recently attempting suicide and live there and figure out about his crime aided by the angel, who admittedly does virtually nothing to help. Unsurprisingly, being beamed into a body where you don't know anything about the person or the people in his life makes for a rough adjustment. Even so, the attitude of Makoto does not make him a very sympathetic character. But as the movie goes on, he reflects upon his own actions and the actions of others, allows him to come to grips with some truths about himself and people in general. Again, I can't say it's a fun movie, and I can't even call it essential anime viewing. Its dialogue does feel very natural, and when he is finally able to make a real connection with another human being, it is a breath of fresh air. So I can very broadly recommend it. You can divide Ghibli films into two groups, its epics and its slice of lives, and Arietti is very much in the later camp. And while it can't hold up next to Kiki or Totoro, it is a vast improvement on that dumb live action movie. It is pretty evident that the big thing Arietti's got going for it are its visuals and its atmosphere, but boy are its visuals and atmosphere just that amazing for me. And its music might actually be one of my favorite Ghibli themes. I love seeing the scaled down details of how the borrowers live, and just watching how they get from place to place and, and how they navigate this world, but I do wish I loved the characters as much as just watching them do things. It's just so peaceful and relaxing. But quick note for dub shamers, uh, you suck. Just let people watch anime the way they want to. That said, Sean? Were we still Americanizing names in 2010? Also, show, you're a creep and you ruined everything. There is something so adorably 90s about this film. The kind of kids film where a cat, a mute child and her policeman mother, and the world's nicest jewel thief take down a mob boss. But then giving it this kind of simplistic art style really is able to capture the ridiculousness, but is still able to be effective when playing it serious. This movie really just has everything. Comedy, suspense, drama, action, weird psychedelics, revenge, cats, and of course, every single movie that takes place in Paris has to end with a fight on either the Eiffel Tower or Notre Dame. This really is so cute and charming, and I'm glad it at least got nominated. Created by the same filmmaker that made the exceptional Triplets of Belleville, the illusionist that is not Edward Norton follows an elderly stage magician, but also a variety of other similar performers who are struggling to maintain their craft in a world that's becoming increasingly modernized, like opera, gymnasts, ventriloquists. The magician comes across a young girl who seems to be the last person that still thinks his craft is cool, so he adopts her? Question mark? 
Except that she really does believe that he can make materials like fancy clothes appear out of nowhere, and the lengths he goes to to keep up the act just to hold on to the one person in the world that still believes that magic is real. This is another very melancholy film, and one that is devoid of any significant dialogue, but there is so much charm and personality into the animation of its characters that it does stay very engaging throughout. Still, while its meaning and sentiment remains very effective, it's also a little bit encouraging that with the rise of social media stars, a lot of these performers today could probably still find an audience. Weirdly enough, all of these acts are really popular on America's Got Talent. The first How to Train Your Dragon is commendable for just how overtly tropey it is, but how it manages to pull a lot of it off exceedingly well. Or at least compensating for a lot of it with gorgeous flying scenes, its world building, its dragon lore, and Toothless just being one of the cutest endearing animal characters in anything. I gave some grief earlier to how cartoony its dragon designs were, but now, I honestly commend them for how unique and colorful and varied you are, especially now since I know how much detail goes into creating each of them as a unique species. And it is also one of the best father-son stories in any film, really. Still, I don't love its high school surrogate supporting cast, and especially how it uses Astrid for the geek wins over ice queen cheerleader cliche, and oh, but she has an axe and that makes her empowered now. But I do genuinely love Astrid and her relationship with Hiccup immensely more in the series, as they have a lot more time to interact as equals and partners before they pull the trigger on the oh one copacetic interaction gets and he gets her to stop yelling. That means they're going out now. Now sure, there's absolutely no design that the movies win when it comes to animation, action, the flying scenes, and emotional devastation. Hiccup and Toothless bonding, Hiccup's fight with his father, and even the Dragon School scenes are some of the best in the franchise. But when it comes to story and character, the series wins by a landslide. Even though I know that that's partially unfair just because they have more time to be able to flesh these characters out. But this movie certainly gets a lot of credit for getting the ball rolling. On and see, cause mama's got this, mama's got this. Sorry if I spit on you, your mama's got this, mama's got this, mama's got this. I remember dreading Tangled a lot when I saw the trailer, because this was Disney officially giving up on 2D animation and going full CGI comedy like Shrek. But Tangled turned out to be a pleasant surprise, and it didn't even use one of the more sillier scenes from the trailer. But given how expensive this film was to make, I understand the need to push this in advertising, but just this time. Tangled, in fact, might be one of Disney's best when it comes to fleshing out and adapting its original story, for providing a reason for the kidnapping and not cutting her hair. It does at times feel a little bit too modern just in its dialogue, but it is very funny and Flynn and Rapunzel are probably my favorite canon Disney couple, if only for being one of the few where half of their screen time isn't spent with fighting. And I love how that carries on into the series. This dance scene is still amazing. Mother Gothel is an underrated villain for being able to pass just enough as a convincing mother figure for her actions to come across as even more disturbing and selfish than some outright murderers. It's also one of the first times I could genuinely say that a CGI film was beautiful. One that reached beyond just going for mostly photorealism and really felt closer to a medieval painting. It was hard to judge its soundtrack when the movie first premiered because you don't know how well those songs are going to age, but now I can say that I still like See the Light, but in general, the Tangled soundtrack has not aged as well as some of Disney's others. Or just that its songs have not become favorites in the same way others have. And for something that has remained as inane as it did then, the bedroom sun scene where Rapunzel just magically puts all the pieces together is still one of the most contrived WTF Disney scenes ever. It is also one of two movies this year that pulled the this is the story of how I died but not really intros. Tangled is still a joy to watch and just passes being worthy of being called a Disney classic. Even if it did start that dumb single word generic title trend, I will never get over it. Studio CG was absorbing everything. It was so great to see at an early attempt at trying to blend the 2D aesthetic with CG and rotoscoping. 
And overall, Chico and Rita is a beautiful looking film about two musicians in Cuba that experience an instant passion so strong that of course every conceivable thing has to go wrong. The story follows their journey on trying to make it big in the 40s Latin music boom in New York, and naturally all of the cultural and historical BS that they had to go through. Aside from its great looking character animation, most of the focus I assume went into Rita's dress, the music is the biggest hook of the film, covering a variety of styles of the time, all astoundingly impeccably performed, which does technically qualify this as a musical, but one where the music is diegetic, a product of the characters in the story. And as much as I can and have rolled my eyes at romances where couples spend more time on screen being petty and snippy and jealous, and generally being responsible for their own misery rather than actually just being together, mostly Chico, that's mostly in the first half and in the second half where they finally try and give it some effort, then it's the world's turn to really F it up for them. Because real romance stories aren't about being together, it's about the longing. Still, it is refreshing to see an actual adult relationship and a very adult story in animation and one that has been so revered for its musical and historical authenticity. Gee, who could have seen this coming? Only one of three animated films that also got nominated for Best Picture, and the culmination of one of the best film trilogies of all time, if not the best one. But yeah, Toy Story 3? Eh, it's a good movie. I feel like I've already talked about this movie a lot. If you want my thoughts more in depth, you can watch the... Okay, I know the title of it is why I like Toy Story 2 more than Toy Story 3, but I still say a lot of really great things. It breaks down a lot of my in-depth thoughts on both of them, and half of that video is admitting that a lot of the reasons for my preference for the second movie is a lot of personal factors, as is why anyone likes anything, really. Still, I can't deny that there's a lot of standout moments in this film. The over-the-top intro, the last staff meeting, almost getting thrown away, the daycare, the daycare horror show, Woody separating from the group, the breakout, the furnace, and Andy's goodbye are all some of the highlights of the entire franchise. The furnace scene alone makes a case for the film and is possibly the darkest moment in a family film ever where no one actually dies. Oh, spoilers. It is one of the best films, period, and honestly should have won Best Picture that year. 